Dr. Seuss Video Classics. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss. Narrated by Walter Matthau. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now, hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings. He snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow he knew all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise! Then the Who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast. And they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast! They would feast on Who pudding and rare Who roast beast. Which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then, they'd do something he liked least of all. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the Who's would start singing. They'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this Who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years, I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea. An awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do. The Grinch laughed in his throat, and he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat, and he chuckled and clucked. What a great Grinchy trick! With this coat and this hat, I look just like Saint Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around, but since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? No, the Grinch simply said, If I can find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max, then he took some red thread, and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, Get up! and the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care. When he came to the first little house on the square, This is stop number one, the old Grinchy claws hissed and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist.
Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a moment or two. And then he stuck his head out of the fireplace blue, where the little Who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room, and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn and plums, and he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch, very nimbly, stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now, grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up. The tree, and the Grinch grabbed the tree, and he started to shove when he heard a small sound, like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast, and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter, who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, "Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why?" But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick. He thought up a lie, and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot? The fake Santa Claus lied. There's a light on this tree that won't light. On one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there. Then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. And he patted her head, and he got her a drink, and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other Who's houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other Who's mouses. It was quarter past dawn. All the Who's still a bed. All the Who's still a snooze. When he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags, and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. Three thousand feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Port the hoods. He was grinchishly humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two, and the hoods down in Hooville will all cry, "Boo hoo!" That's a noise. Grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so. But it was merry, very. 
He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. We wish the world a who happy Christmas. A who happy Christmas. A who happy Christmas. A who happy Christmas. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. If I Ran the Zoo, by Dr. Seuss. It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew. And the fellow who runs it seems proud of it, too. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I'd do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff they have up there now are not quite good enough. You see things like these in just any old zoo. They're awfully old-fashioned. I want something new. So I'd open each cage. I'd unlock every pen, let the animals go, and start over again. And somehow or other, I think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. A four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo will have ten feet, at least. Five legs on the left, and five more on the right. Then people will stare, and they'll say, what a sight! This zookeeper, new keeper Gerald's quite keen. That's the gall darndest lion I ever have seen. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people talk. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. I'll get for my zoo a new sort of a hen who roosts in another hen's top knot, and then another one roosts in the top knot of his, and another in his and another in his, and so forth, and upward and onward. Gee whiz! But that's just a start. I'll do better than that. They'll see me next day in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. They'll be so surprised, they'll all swallow their gum. They'll ask, when they see my strange animals come, where do you suppose he gets things like that from? His animals all have such very odd faces. I'll bet he must hunt them in rather odd places. And that's what I'll do, 
said young Gerald McGrew. If you want to catch beasts you don't see every day, you have to go places quite out of the way. You have to go places no others can get to. You have to get cold, and you have to get wet, too. Up past the North Pole, where the frozen winds squeal, I'll go and I'll hunt in my Skeagle-mobile and bring back a family of what do you know? And that's how my new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will grow. I'll hunt in the mountains of Zamba Matong with helpers who all wear their mustaches long and capture a fine fluffy bird called the Bustard who only eats custard with sauce made of mustard and also a very fine beast called the Flustered who only eats mustard with sauce made of custard. I'll catch them in caves and I'll catch them in brooks I'll catch them in crannies. I'll catch them in nooks that you don't read about in geography books. I'll catch them in countries that no one can spell, like the country of Mata Fapata Fapel. In a country like that, if a hunter is clever, he'll hunt up some beasts that you never saw, ever. I'll load up five boats with a family of jokes whose feet are like cows, but wear squirrel skin coats, and sit down like dogs, but have voices like goats, excepting they can't sing the very high notes. And then I'll go down to the wilds of Nantucket and capture a family of lunks in a bucket. Then people will say, now I like that boy heaps. His new zoo, McGrew Zoo, is growing by leaps. He captures them wild, and he captures them meek. He captures them slim, and he captures them sleek. What do you suppose he will capture next week? I'll capture one tiny. I'll capture one cute. I'll capture a deer that no hunter would shoot. A deer that's so nice, he could sleep in your bed if it weren't for those horns that he has on his head. And speaking of horns that are just a bit queer, I'll bring back a very odd family of deer. A father, a mother, two sisters, a brother, whose horns are connected from one to the other, whose horns are so mixed they can't tell them apart. Can't tell where they end, and can't tell where they start. Each deer's mighty puzzled. He's never yet found if his horns are hers or the other way round. I'll capture them fat, and I'll capture them scrawny. I'll capture a scragglefoot mulligatawny, a high-stepping animal, fast as the wind from the blistering sands of the desert of Zind. This beast is the beast that the brave chieftains ride when they want to go fast to find some place to hide. A mulligatawny is fine for my zoo. And so is a chieftain. I'll bring one back too. In the far western part of southeast North Dakota, lives a very fine animal called the iota. But I'll capture one who is even much finer in the northeastern west part of South Carolina. When people see him, they will say, now by thunder, this new zoo, McGrew Zoo, is really a wonder. Most beasts are quite friendly, but still, in some lands, some beasts are too dangerous to catch with bare hands. For those that are ugly and vicious and mean, I'll build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit, but with it a hunter can never get bit. 
a zoo should have bugs. So I'll capture a thwirl, whose legs are snarled up in a terrible snarl. And then I'll go out and I'll capture some chugs, some keen shooter, mean shooter, bean shooter bugs. I'll go to the African island of Yurka and bring back a tizzle-topped tufted mazurka. A kind of canary with quite a tall throat. His neck is so long, if he swallows an oat for breakfast the first day of April, they say, it has to go down such a very long way that it gets to his stomach the 15th of May. I'll bag a big bug who's very surprising. A feller who has a propeller for rising and zooming around, making cross-country hops from Texas to Boston with only two stops. Now that sort of thing for a bug is just tops. And when I've caught him, then the next thing you know, I'll go and I'll capture a wild tic-tac-toe. With X's that win and with zeros that lose, He'll look mighty good in this zoo of McGrews. I'll bring back a gusset, a gherkin, a gasket, and also a gooch from the wilds of Nantasket. And eight Persian princes will carry the basket. But what their names are, I don't know, so don't ask it. In a cave in Khartoum lives a beast called the Natch that no other hunter's been able to catch. He's hidden for years in his cave with a pelt, and no one's been able to make him come out. But I'll coax him out with a wonderful meal that's cooked by my cooks in my cooker-mobile. They'll fix up a dish that is just to his taste, three chicken croquettes made of library paste, then sprinkled with peanut shucks, pickled and spiced, then baked at 600 degrees, and then iced. It's mighty hard cooking to cook up such feasts, but that's how the new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets beasts. I'll go to the faraway mountains of Tobsk, near the river of Nobsk, and I'll bring back an Obsk, a sort of a kind of a thingamabobsk, who only eats rhubarb and corn on a cobsk. Then people will flock to my zoo in a mobsk. McGrew, they will say, does a wonderful jobsk. He hunts with such vim, and he hunts with such vigor. His new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets bigger and bigger. And speaking of birds, there's the Russian Paluski, whose head ski is red ski and belly is blue ski. I'll get one of them for my Zuski Magruski. Then the whole town will gasp. Why this boy never sleeps. No keeper before ever kept what he keeps. There's no telling what that young fellow will do. And then, just to show them, I'll sail to Katru and bring back an Itkutch, a Preep, and a Pru, a Nurkle, a Nerd, and a Seersucker, too. I'll hunt in the jungles of Hippo No Hungus and bring back a flock of Wild Bippo No Bungus. The Bippo No Bungus from Hippo No Hungus are better than those down in Dippo No Dungus and smarter than those out in Nippo No Nungus. And that's why I'll catch them in Hippo No Hungus instead of those others in Nungus and Dungus. And people will say when they see these bips bounding, this zookeeper, new keeper, is simply astounding. He travels so far that you'd think he would drop. When do you suppose this young fellow will stop? Stop? Well, I should. But I won't stop until I've captured the Fizzama Wizamadil, the world's biggest bird from the island of Gwark. 
who only eats pine trees and spits out the bark. And boy, when I get him back home to my park, the whole world will say, Young McGrew's made his mark. He's built a zoo better than Noah's whole ark. These wonderful, marvelous beasts that he chooses have made him the greatest of all the McGrewses. Wow, they'll all cheer. What this zoo must be worth. It's the gold darndest zoo on the face of the earth. Yes, that's what I'd do. Said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes. If I ran the zoo, 